Today's training class will cover Silver Financial Planner. We have both a desktop and online edition of Silver available. Today's class is going to focus on that online edition, also known as Silver Online. So a little background information about Silver. It's designed to be a really easy, effective solution for busy planners. It's something that you can gather the information, enter all the data input required, generate the report, and review the financial plan in under two hours. Uh, this allows you to spend you know, less time creating these actual plans and more time having that conversation with your clients. There is a really nice interactive piece to this as well called the what if, which we'll make sure to cover in today's class. So with the online version, the most important thing to know is how to get there. So if you open up your browser, let me log out here. If you go to moneytree.com slash silveronline, that will direct you to this application and to the login page. From there, you can enter in your email address and password. If you don't, or don't already have an account, you can sign up for a 30-day free trial. Once you provide that username and password, then you're into the system. So you'll notice a few things. We land on the Clients tab. This is where we're going to spend a majority of our time. This is going to be where you actually have your clients stored and the data input for the plans and can generate those reports and play with the what ifs. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. There's some additional tabs for administration, management, and settings. Management reports allows you to essentially, this is purely optional, but you can create a management group and then that manager can view reports uh, the reports that are available are activity reports, which show things like how many reports have been run in the system, how many clients have been entered, how many what-ifs have been generated. You can also choose to, to see advisor summary or details, which shows per advisor how many clients are assigned to them, what their assets um, under management are based on what's in for entered into the system here. So that's management reports in a nutshell. So you get both the activity and advisor type information. Administration, this tab is going to be available to all new users. If you sign up for a trial or you're brand new to the system, you're going to automatically be set up as the program administrator. If you do have multiple users in your company, you can create the users here and you can choose to give them different roles. So if somebody is not an administrator, they would not have this tab. Um, they would just have the settings tab and clients tab. So if somebody is an administrator, you'll see this information. This is where you can set up custom user roles. For example, we have a limited role set up here where this uh, role, anybody assigned to it, would not be able to change their settings, export information, or delete clients. So if we click on that, we can see how it's set up. It's pretty easy, straightforward. There's just some options that, that you can choose from for these user roles. So client management tab is the first tab. We're saying that view slash edit all contacts. That means that this client can see contacts that belong to any advisors. If we uncheck that box, this user assigned to this role would only be able to see client files that were assigned to this advisor. Second item is to allow import of contacts. So if they can import information from our desktop application or our secure online planning uh, survey. The next item is to allow export of plans outside of the system. So in this case, this user is not able to export anything out of the system. Also delete. This user is not able to delete since we do not have that box checked. The last item is if you want user to be able to view or enter social security numbers. If you check this box, that will keep social security numbers out of the data input and out of the reports. The next tab we have is user settings. So this is going to be if you want this user to be able to customize some of the program settings. That's going to include the asset allocation, which are the asset class names and allocation uh, percentages, cover page information including a logo, long-term care cost defaults, and the ability to customize reports which is which is going to entail creating their own list of reports available. So the other items here, asset allocation, cover page, these are all items that can be set up as default. So if you want to, you do want to go through this section, customize the information, 
That way when you do add new planners, their settings section will be pre-populated with the company defaults that you've set up under administration. If the advisor does have permission to edit this information based on their user role, they'll see the same items under their settings section. They'll be able to modify if they um, have that permission under settings. So if they want to change the class names or cover page information, they'll see it there. In this case, I'm an administrator, so all, those, all that information is available for me under administration. And under settings, I just have a limited set of information, which is going to be changing my profile information, my password, and budget expense items. So let's go to the main clients tab. This is where we can see the list of the clients that have been entered. This is where we can also sort it by advisor. So if I wanted to see just clients assigned to me, I can click on search and see that there's only two. But in this case, my permissions allow me to see everybody since I'm an administrator. So I see my full list of clients. If I want to add a new client, I just click on add client, enter in their personal information. Uh, all that's going to be required here is first name, last name, birth date, married couple, if that is checked, you, um, you'll get some benefits from that, like Social Security, spousal benefits, so you don't want to overlook that box. But gender and Social Security address information is optional, doesn't have to be entered. Same with employment. So once you have that information entered, you can create a new plan. Oops, if my fingers could type on the right keys here. Okay, so here I am as a sample client. I can click on update, and now this new client has been created. And if I want to create a plan for this client, all I need to do is click on the plus sign to create a new plan. Enter in an, a title and optionally a description. Once I have this plan created, I can do uh, get into the main data input by doing open edit plan, this also gives you some additional functions. So if you had a full plan created, let's say you did a plan last year and you want to update it, you can copy their existing plan and make changes to the new plan, leaving that old plan intact. Uh, you can also choose to export plans or import plans from here. So rather than this uh, starting a new client from scratch, I'm going to open up one of our existing clients to go through the data input. and. I think we've got John Sample here somewhere. There he is. And I could also have searched for John Sample to find him that way. But here's my client information. This is where I can assign the client to a different advisor. If I need to edit any of the client information, I can. We can see the existing plan. And what I want to do is open edit plan. This is going to take me to the heart of the program. This is going to be the data input for this plan, the reports that can be generated for this plan, and the what if for this plan. So to go through this uh, different data input sections, first we have names and ages where you need to set a planned retirement age, life expectancy. The life expectancy is calculated and grayed out. The program calculates individual one's life expectancy based on a single lifetime table, and for individual two, it just tags on five more years. If we want to use anything other than that calculated value, just drop down to this alternate life expectancy field, and turn a value there, and the program will use that instead. If any of this other information doesn't apply, like married couple, oops, that wasn't supposed to be yes, you just need to click on contact information to make the changes there on that contact level. One thing that you have to keep in mind when you're using this online application is you have to click on save to save your changes. So if you've entered information like an alternate life expectancy and you move away and come back, Silver Online is not going to save that change. So just make sure that you enter in the value, click on save or save and continue, which just it saves and then advances you to the next data input. So the next data input item is risk. And this is just going to be where you're setting a risk tolerance level for the client. There's a risk tolerance test that you can check the, the check boxes and have the program set a risk tolerance level based on the, the answers. That risk tolerance test is included in the questionnaire. There is, at the top right hand side, open silver questionnaire. If you click on that, it will open up a Word document 
and that is going to collect all the information from your client that is required for the plan. That will make life super easy because it actually collects not only all the information, but it collects it in the same order as the program asks for it. So, so if you have your client fill out that questionnaire, it will make data entry a breeze into the system here. So once we have the risk tolerance set, we can move on to estate. The estate section is something you can skip if you're not trying to use the estate planning reports. If you are, you want to fill out the information here, including what kind of estate strategies they already have in place, if they're going to be gifting any amount to charity, um, probate and administration type expense uh, percentage. So you'll want to fill out the pertinent information. Once you're through with that, you can move on to insurance. And insurance is going to collect their life insurance. So life insurance policies will go here. We can see what's already been entered. If I need to add new policies or modify the existing policies that have already been entered, just click on this add slash modify policies button. So I can move through the different policies that have already been entered on the left hand side, but when I do add a policy, I just need to fill out the name, who's the insured, owner, beneficiary, what type of policy it is, death benefit, Premiums are optional, so you don't have to fill out that information, but if you do have it, you can enter it in. The program's mainly concerned with this death benefit. For term policies, uh, the program essentially assumes that it ends at retirement age. What really drives that is these two checkboxes at the bottom. So the first checkbox is include policy death benefit and retirement projection. If you check this box, we're going to say, okay, this $100,000 death benefit would be available when this person dies. In this case, it's individual two, uh, individual two's life expectancy. Since this is a term policy, that's actually not going to be true, so we want to just make sure we uncheck that first box. The second box is the same question, other than it's looking at, instead of retirement projection, the survivor needs analysis. And the survivor needs analysis look at if death were to occur today. So in this case, yes, individual two, if she were to die today, this $100,000 death benefit would be available for individual one to live off of, so we would want to check that box. For a whole life policy, typically those, both those boxes would be checked rather than term, just the second box checked. So you can add new items or delete items. To save your changes, make sure you hit OK. In this case, I'm going to hit cancel since I haven't changed anything. So once you have all the life insurance policies entered, you have the ability to enter in long-term care coverage if they do have a long-term care plan. Long-term care cost override amount, if you leave this zero, that's when the program's gonna pick from the information that you have either in your settings or your defaults under administration. Once you're through with that section, you can click on save and continue to advance to income, pension, social security. So this is going to be collecting these income streams of pensions, earned income, and Social Security. You'll notice we have a spot for two pensions per person. What we're asking for individual one and two, so first pension for individual one, in this case individual one has a defined pension benefit of $7,200 a year. It's starting at age 62. It does not increase before starting age, but it will increase at 3% a year after it starts at age 62. And you have the ability to enter if any of this benefit is available to a surviving spouse. So in this case, there is no survivor benefit on this pension. You'll notice we have a lump sum checkbox too, and this is for lump sum pension payouts. If we check the box, you'll notice those last two boxes get disabled. But what we can do is enter in a lump sum pension. So if he were to get a $100,000 lump sum at age 65 and it increased at 2% between now and his age 65, with this box checked, is we would see a one-time lump sum income that would automatically get rolled over into his, his uh, retirement plan money. So it would automatically get rolled over into a tax-deferred type retirement plan. Gonna zero that stuff out. I could also just make sure not to hit save if I didn't want to save my changes. Current earned income, enter that information here. That will be used for the cash flow report, the insurance reports. It will also be used to estimate Social Security benefits. So if you have the Social Security uh, 
statement for the client and you know an expected benefit amount, go ahead and plug that amount here in this last box. If you don't, the program will be able to estimate it based on that earned income. Social Security start age, any increase you want to assume on those Social Security benefits, and again, if you, knew, if you have the statement, you know the, the actual estimated benefit amount, type that in rather than the program calculating it. If you want to keep Social Security out of the projection, you'll notice this note in blue, set, set start age to zero. So if we do that, this would ensure that individual one would not get Social Security benefits. Also, if we wanted to make sure this individual did not receive any survivor Social Security benefits, we could also check this box. So with this combination, individual two would not get Social Security uh, in any of the reports in any of the situations. As long as we have a start age in there and an earned income, the program will be able to estimate a benefit for us. The next input item is expenses. So we've collected their income, now let's collect their expenses. We can keep things real simple and just enter in a total expense amount, or you can use this budget calculation worksheet. This budget worksheet is also available in the questionnaire, so if the client provides that information for you, you can plug in the values here. If you do that and hit OK, the program will populate these totals for you. If not, you can also just keep it general and say, OK, this client is spending about $70,000 a year right now. In retirement, we expect their expenses to go down a little bit, down to $57,500. So we have two periods, current and retirement, as well as um, different amounts for surviving households. So for a survivor situation, if you expect the expenses to be different, in this case we're expecting them to be a little bit lower, we can reflect that here. And of course your assumed inflation rate to apply to those expenses uh, to the right. So the next data input item, we could click on save and continue or just click on the input item on this left hand side, is the special income planner. So we can add future special income type items here. Here's an example, a gift from parents $5,000 increasing 2% starting in 2009, so that's a little bit of an older example. Number of years, this could be 1, it could be 10, it could be um, 1 if it's just a single year item, 10 if it's an income stream coming in for 10 years. Once you do have a special income item, you'll just want to click on insert for it to save before clicking on continue. So we have special income items to capture kind of income items that don't necessarily fit other places. So things like a lump sum uh, income that they're receiving, um, if they're going to be selling like a la uh, piece of land that they have in the future, that would be a great item to enter in the special income planner. The next item is special expenses slash goals, and these are for uh, special goals future large purchases, expenses, these are items that the program, that the client, excuse me, is not going to be able to cover out of their regular cash flow. This is something that they would actually need to pull from their assets to cover. So items like a European vacation, replacing a roof or redoing a kitchen, this $12,000 would actually come from the client's assets if it's occurring prior to retirement, rather than just assumed to be covered with their regular uh, income. So when we add purchases, just like the special expense planner, we can see the uh, description, after tax amount, increase rate, first year, number of years, and then in, for expenses, an item that we don't have an income is a priority, and this will be used for a special goal funding report which evaluates the feasibility of cover all, covering all of these special expense type items. Next item we have is education funding, so if there are no dependent children or no, no kids to put through college, you can skip this section altogether. If there are, it's pretty straightforward. We can collect the child's name, age, college start age, cost of college, number of years, if they have any amount saved, and if they're making any annual additions, that can be entered, and all that information will be used for an education funding report. So if I wanted to add a new child, I can, or add an existing child, I can. This cost per year, we have a college cost estimator to help you come up with that cost. And we can narrow down the schools by state. So we're in Oregon. 
we can list the schools in Oregon and we're in Corvallis where we have Oregon State so if we wanted to look at tuition rates for Oregon State University we can select it here so you can see the tuition we can change in state or out of state we can add in things like housing cost and any additional amount that you want to add as a percentage uh, for a, a cushion or a specific dollar amount and you can choose OK to, to help estimate that college cost per year. So that uh, choose college can be a handy feature when you're trying to come up with that college cost estimator. So once you have that information entered in for children, there's an important checkbox here, include net cost of education expenses in retirement calculations. If you do not have this box checked, you'll get your education funding report, which would show the client how much their total education cost will be and what kind of savings they need to make in order to fund the college costs. But you won't have that college cost impact the parent's retirement projections. If we do check this box, what we're saying is the parents actually are going to cover any of the uncovered college costs by uh, essentially pulling from their assets to cover those those college expenses. So that checkbox can make a big difference in the plan. If the parents are planning to pull from their assets to cover their children's education costs, you'll want to make sure to check that box. Otherwise, you can leave the box unchecked and you'll just get the education funding report. It will not impact the parent's retirement projection. You can also set your assumed inflation rate for the education costs as well as an after-tax rate of return for the college funds um, that you're actually saving for these costs. So the next data input item is assets and this is where you're going to spend a little time entering in all the different uh, assets that the clients have and this is all investment type assets so uh, anything like their residence or property, private property type items are going to go in the next uh, other assets slash debt section. So assets is going to be purely for investment type assets. So I can add a new asset or edit one of these existing assets. If we look at cash, you can see it's pretty straightforward. You just need to fill out a description, owner, type, which is just a drop down giving you some commonly used asset types balance, how much uh, is in this cash asset today, additions, so if they're making any additions into this account, how much are they putting away, starting year, if they're going to be starting additions in the future rather than the current year, you could fill that out, and number of years, uh, if it's going to be limited. So starting year and number of years, if you just leave zero like we've done here, the program is going to assume those additions occur from current age until retirement age. But if you want to do something more specific, that's where you can fill out that starting year and number of years. It's important to choose an account taxation. This is where you can choose whether it's a regular taxable account or retirement account. Um, some of that's going to be limited based on the type that you have selected. Choose an asset class. You see that uh, employer additions in this case is grayed out because this is a regular savings and investment type assets. If I wanted to save my changes, I would make sure I clicked on Update Assets before clicking Continue at the bottom. In this case, I'm going to hit Cancel. And let's look at one of their 401k type assets. So you can notice here, Annual Additions for Owner, and now that it's a 401k, uh, the Annual Additions for the Employer also picks up and becomes available for you. So you'll get all their assets in there and you'll be able to see a summary of what's been entered. Then you can move forward to asset allocation. This is optional. The program will, will populate a suggested allocation based on what's set up under administrative, uh, excuse me, administration or settings, depending on the user permissions. But if, if you want to enter in a specific suggested allocation for this case rather than using what's set up in the default, you can enter in a suggested allocation just by filling out this column here. We'll move on then to other assets and debts. And this is going to be where you're entering in any non-investment type assets. So things like residence, personal property, automobiles can all go here. Also liabilities, so things like their mortgage, credit card, uh, auto loans, you can enter in that information. This information as far as regarding uh, payments, this is used for the debt freedom reports. 
If you do not want to use the debt freedom reports, you can leave this information to the right blank and just enter in the liability balances and owners. The debt freedom looks at kind of that debt snowball type effect of paying off the higher interest rate loans first, um, and it will come up with a, a debt freedom plan for the client. If you choose to you, you use that debt freedom section, make sure you fill out this information. And then there's an additional input which allows you to apply an additional amount towards the debt. So if they have an extra $100 a month they could throw towards those debts, you can capture that here and it'll be included in that debt freedom plan. So the last of the data input section is the required data input sections, I should say, is the rates. And this is going to be where you're setting up the rates of return. Uh, primarily as well as the tax rates. So the program groups the assets based on their account taxation types. So all the taxable savings and investments get grouped together and tracked going forward, earning the rate of return that you've specified here. So they would get 7% pre-retirement and it would switch to 6% post-retirement. So you have the opportunity to enter in a rate of return for the period before retirement as well as that period after retirement. Uh, retirement accounts all get grouped together and they would earn a separate rate of return as well as tax-free or annuity type assets. The program is going to ask you to enter in the tax rate. The program will apply this tax rate so for every dollar of, of interest or dollar of earned income, whatever taxable ordinary income, the program is going to charge 25 cents for taxes based on this 25% tax rate that I've set here and switch to 20% post-retirement. Standard deviation, uh, the program will calculate that for you automatically. If you want to override it, you can enter in a different standard deviation here. Discount rate for survivor needs, net present value calculation. This is used for the life insurance reports. What it does is it looks at all the years going forward, brings it back into today's dollars to determine how much life insurance they would need today. So people typically like to use like an after-tax rate of return here, and you can see that the 6% corresponds pretty well to that for this application, for this plan. We also have the ability to set increases for account deposits, so where individual one was putting $1,000 into his 401k, we're saying this thousand dollars is going to increase at three percent each year so that addition to that asset is going to go up over time until that retirement age. A couple more options for you. Proportionalized calculations. The program by default does a rolling 12 months so the first year in the projection is going to be 12 months from the day that you run the plan. If you choose instead, you can check this box which is going to change that first year from a full 12 months to be based on the calendar year. So it's going to say, let's say it's uh, June 1st and we check this box, the program is going to show six months for the first year. So it's going to show six months of addition, six months of earned income, rather than that full 12 months. So that's just an option for you depending on your preference of how that first year is treated in the program. The last item is to use fat tails, which of course impacts the Monte Carlo that's going to give you some more weighting on those extreme negative market events, so it'll be a little bit more conservative for the Monte Carlo analysis. So once you're through with that, that's really everything that you need to run the reports and view that full financial plan or get into that what if feature. We have an addition, additional uh, tool called the behavior analysis, and this allows you to do some more, more complex modeling using Monte Carlo. So the regular Monte Carlo looks at varying rates of return every year. This behavior analysis also allows you to look at varying spending. So not only can you vary the rates of return, you can also choose to vary the inflation, and you can do variable spending. So you can have a budget floor, a budget ceiling, and a ratio between those two. So budget floor would mean that the client was would could spend down to 90% of their current budget, or budget ceiling, they could spend up to 125% of their current budget. And what that would mean is when the program runs those Monte Carlo simulations and they have a really poor rate of return, the program's not going to spend 100% of their budget. It's actually going to kind of try to model some reactive behavior and say, okay, well, 
you know, if we had a really bad year, we would probably buckle down on our expenses a little bit and we'd spend less of our budget. In this case, we could spend down as low as our budget floor. Or if the rate of return was really great that year, the program would allow them to spend a little bit more upwards to their budget ceiling. So that's trying to reflect, in most cases, uh, this will show a little higher result, assuming some reactive behavior. So they have a bad return, they spend a little less. If they have a good return, they spend a little bit more. Overall, their Monte Carlo success tends to be higher. Uh, the other idea that it introduces on top of this variable spending is looking at different retirement ages. So it will, it will evaluate different retirement ages based on what you have set as initial withdrawal rate. Uh, so in this case, we're looking at if the, this client was to retire in a range of either two years early or two years late. And to evaluate if they're able to retire, the program's going to look at this initial withdrawal rate limit of 4% or 4.5% in this case. When we look at the results here, it shows at 64, 9%. And what this means is that 64 of those trials that were run, 9% of the time, their assets were high enough that they could pull to cover their expenses without exceeding a withdrawal of 4.5%. So that's not so great. Um, but if we look at age 66, pushing it back a couple of years, 65% of the time they were able to cover their expenses without pulling more than 4.5% of their assets at that point. So there's a lot more information on the behavior analysis. You can get to a help quick start guide right here. There's also more information on the reports. If you choose not to include this, uh, you would just want to make sure you just uncheck this data input, zero out these items. The program will not generate the behavior analysis report, so it's completely optional. We normally recommend just getting through the main program before you start exploring and playing with this tool. But it is pretty cool once you get it all figured out. So from there, we're going to go ahead and jump into the what if. So we have all the information entered to create that financial plan. So here we have our what if report. We have a side by side view. We can also choose a single graph, which is going to fit, fit a little bit better on my monitor, or an overlay. So if we look at this, we can see the graphical view of their retirement situation right now. We haven't, of course, looked at any of the numbers that are used to generate it, but graphically what we can see is their assets are growing and building up to about a million dollars, but as they retire, they start to deplete their assets and they actually run a shortage the last five years or so of the projection. This what if is where you can actually say, well, what if, and model specific situations really quickly, kind of instant changes. So if you could say, well, what if, you know, you guys were to retire a year later? So if I said, okay, we're going to retire instead of 64 at 65, we'll start Social Security at that age as well. With that change alone, we can say, okay, what if we retired a year later, recalculate, and we can instantly see the results. So we can see the green line now here is this new scenario versus the original scenario. So things look a lot better. So instead of just having uh, five years of shortages, now we have one year of shortage. So we could play on top of that. Well, what if you guys were to put $5,000 into your Roth? Oops, sorry, I'm doing something funny with my mouse. $5,000 into your Roth each year instead of $2,000. Recalculate again. And then we will be able to see our results here. Okay, so now we can see things look a lot better. Their Monte Carlo success rate is up to 76%. We can see that they are not projected to run out of money based on the variables that we have here. So you can see the variables. It's not everything that you can enter into the plan, but the most commonly controlled type variables. You can choose to save these what ifs and include them in the reports as well. So if we said retire one year later, 65, uh, Roth additions, 5K click on save report and so you can save any of those reports here and choose to print with the reports. So from here once you have that what if um, you can jump to the other section so we could go back to our data input we could view the graphs which are just full size presentation style graphs or we can get 
the financial planning report. So when I click on reports, we have some options. We can choose to include page numbers with our reports. If you want the reports to specify that it's a draft copy, we have that option. Um, so you just check the items that apply, and then you need to choose which reports you want to run. So by default, uh, the first report here is entire report. If I select that and click on generate report, that's going to ensure all the reports possible get generated for me. You can also narrow down the reports that are generated to those related to just retirement, estate, insurance, debt freedom, you have some options here. You can also create custom reports, so either under administration, your administrator can do that for you, or if you have permissions to do it, you'll have the option under settings. In this case, I'll go ahead and select the entire report. Generating that report, you can see it's working, it will take just a little time to get that report going. And as soon as it's available, this orange button will open up and you can click on it and it will open that report for you. So if I say silver report, depending on what browser you use, I'm using Chrome, it doesn't automatically open. Some, some will, mine will not. And now we can see not only do I have this uh, financial plan saved, I can open it up and it's just a PDF file. So in this case, since I generated that full set of reports, it is 57 pages altogether. So we can see the cover page prepared by Silver Financial Planner, our address. This, of course, is all the information that you would customize in your own program. If you chose to include a logo for your cover, it would show up here as well. Information about the plan, a summary of the plan, so you can see their current situation, you know, what kind of assets, liabilities, net worth. Uh, that the client currently has, goals as far as when they want to retire, what they want to spend in retirement, um, what their last life expectancy is set as, some analysis details, and in this case where the client is running out of money, the program will come up with some shortage solutions. So this can be really handy. These are things you can also plug into that what if and model. They have an option of uh, increasing their savings, so if they increase their savings by $5,000 a year, that would eliminate their shortfall. If they would also uh, have an option of reducing their spending, so if they reduce their spending by $4,700 a year, that would work. Or delay their retirement two years, as we saw in the what if when we were trying that one year wasn't quite enough, but two years would, would, would allow them to make it without running out of money. Or of course, of any combination or any action you can you can uh, think of that to solve that short of solutions, but those are the, the actions that will be automatically calculated in the system. So we won't go through all the reports here, but I'll try to highlight some of the main report pages. We have assumptions, which is a great report to give your client and for you just to review the information that's entered in the system and make sure there's no glaring errors, like you entered in um, a monthly amount instead of an annual amount for Social Security. So these are items that you can kind of keep your eyes open and view that assumptions page. Their net worth, asset worksheet, asset allocation, retirement profile, resources available for retirement which goes along with the previous page, retirement summary, so this is the same graph we saw when we jumped to that what if section. This is going to, unlike the what if, which doesn't have any text on the page, is going to give a description of what you're seeing, as well as provide those shorted solutions when they are running out of money. Information on the Monte Carlo, as well as the Monte Carlo graph. You can see the blue line here. That blue line is the fixed result, so that's their retirement projection with the fixed rates of return. The trials are represented by these gray lines, so those are the 10,000 trials that are run. It's a sample of those 10,000 trials with the varying rates of return. So you can see some information below the graph which shows us the percentage of funds at last life expectancy. In this original scenario it was only 16%, um, so they essentially were running out of money. Their worst case, they also of course ran out of money, but we could see it could happen a lot sooner. 
one of their trials at least ended up really well with about $5 million, but we know that is very few of those 10,000 trials that were run. Behavior analysis information, so if you did choose to include the behavior analysis reports, you could see that we have the same graphs that we saw on the data input, but a lot more details to go along with it. So this is a great place to read more about the behavior analysis as you're getting familiar with it. Goal evaluation, so when we looked at those special expense type items, this is where you could set the priority level, and this is what that information is used for. So it shows you your Monte Carlo success if you include just essential expenses or all these type expenses. So our Monte Carlo would go up to 22% if we didn't include any of these primary or secondary expenses and just covered our, our essential expense of replacing the roof. Still not great, but a little bit better. Retirement expenses, a graphical view of their cash flow, a numbers report to support that graph of the cash flow. So we can see pre-retirement, their income sources include earned income. The negative amounts that you see here are actually their deposits that they're making into their retirement accounts. Once it turns to black, it's actually the withdrawals that they're taking from those accounts. Investment accounts, pre-retirement, we have a little bit of a mix uh, in red. Typically that's going to be, again, those additions, but the program might also be taking some money out for things like a special expense item that they would have to pull from their assets to cover. Pension and Social Security, when those items start, makes up for their total sources, just adding up everything to the left, compared to their living expenses and taxes to determine if they have a shortage or a surplus. One thing that's important to know in this program is it is a goal-based planning program, so these surpluses prior to retirement are ignored. The program is running off the assumption that they're only saving what you've actually specified by making those de uh, deposits or additions into the assets. So the fact that we see an $8,000 surplus here, the program's not going to assume that's being saved. It's only going to save what we actually have specified as account deposits. Post-retirement, the program changes gears. So if there's a surplus post-retirement, it will save. If there's a shortage pre-retirement, um, the program will ignore that pre-retirement shortage or surplus. But as soon as they are retired, it will switch modes and it will make sure to, to account for every shortage or surplus going forward. So once they do retire, the program is going to take distributions from their assets to ensure that they have enough to cover their living expenses and taxes and it won't show a shortage here until their accounts were actually depleted and they weren't able to cover those expenses by assets any longer. A view of their assets, and then we get into the retirement capital analysis, and this is kind of the heart of the retirement reports. This shows you pre-retirement, not too much is going on because the program's really concerned with how their assets are growing prior to retirement with the exception of some of these special expense or income items. Um, so we can see prior to retirement, we've got additions going into our assets. We can see that accounts grow with those additions and the rates of return. But once they do retire, we see spending start. We can see items like Social Security and pensions coming in. And that shortage that you have is just the difference between what they're spending, what's coming in from these outside income sources of pension and Social Security. And this is going to be the amount that the program needs to pull from their assets to cover. One thing you'll notice here is the expenses are lower for the years be, uh, between individual one and two's retirement age. And the program, as soon as one person retires, starts that retirement spending. If one person's still working, it will apply that working individual's after-tax earned income to the spending amount to make sure to account for the fact that one individual is still working. And then once they both retire, switch to that full spending. So we can see the numbers that go along with the graph that we saw when we looked at the what if for the graph that we saw on the retirement summary page, that their assets are growing and then depleting and actually running out before individual two's last life expectancy, about five years before that last life expectancy. The next reports are going to be uh, the asset projections, and again the program groups those assets by their uh, taxation type, so all the savings uh, and taxable type investments will get grouped together, tax deferred, tax deferred retirement accounts, so you can get the details of how those balances are changing over time on these pages. 
The next section is talking about life insurance. So it does a survivor needs analysis for both individuals. And this looks at if death were to occur today. So the first survivor needs analysis is looking at John's insurance. So this would be assuming that John were to die and his spouse Mary would uh, be a survivor. So what it does is it looks at the present value of all the spending needs. So this is Mary's spending needs from her current age until her life expectancy adding on some education expenses, other final expenses, um, special expense type items. From there we can see a total present value of what her spending will be from now until life expectancy which is about 1.5 million. But she is going to be working and she is going to be getting Social Security benefits which amount to about $750,000. That will come in and help offset that total spending. The difference is going to be that survivor need shortage amount. The program's also going to make sure that they have enough to cover their existing liabilities. Then it's going to consider what kind of assets they have available now, what kind of life insurance coverage is already available to come up with a suggested additional life insurance needs. So we're saying that John should have more like $800,000 of insurance rather than the $300,000 that he has. So he would need about a half a million dollar policy in addition to his current coverage. So we have that same report for individual two, and then the calculations to support it. The program also does a, a little bit of disability and long-term care planning. And then we get into the next section, which is estate planning. The program's going to look at a current situation, which in this case is just a simple will, marital transfer type situation. And then it's also going to come up with an alternative situation which looks at taking advantage of credit shelter trust and moving any life insurance into an islet. So we can see that alternative situation flowchart and it will have supporting number type report behind it. Those look at if um, death were to occur today what their estate situation would be. This next page that we're looking at now also projects 10 years into the future which in this case um, with about a maximum in this projection 10 years out of under a million dollars still they do not have an estate tax situation as we can see. But for clients that are maybe on the cusp they can look look at their future situation and see if it is an issue coming up for them. The next page is our education funding report. So if you did enter in those dependent children and college costs this is the report page that's going to tell us what kind of deposits we need to make to cover these uh, education costs. So we have two children that are getting put through school. We can see their total cost is going to be just under $200,000. They have $20,000 now. They could make a lump sum deposit if they were able to of $107,000 uh, today, or they can make annual deposits of just under $14,000 a year. Um, these numbers are actually a little different than the numbers you see up above and in this table. And that question comes up quite often in support. And the difference is this is looking at funding the children separately. So if we were to pay for Janie, we would have to pay for her uh, school by making deposits of $6,624 from now until her last year of college. And we do the same thing for John from now until his last year of college. The numbers up above and the numbers illustrated in this table is assuming that we're making level payments. So it's going to be one deposit between now and that last child's last year of college. So that's why that number looks a little bit lower than the number that we see here. So if they did make that level deposit, this is the deposit required and they would pay for the, all the college costs um, based on that information. So that's your education funding report. Then we have some additional uh, education type reports on investments. Then we get into the debt freedom. So this is going to come up with their debt freedom plan, which they're saying uh, based on their credit card and auto loans, if we were to apply the payments to that higher credit card debt, we could pay off our loan in two years, three months faster. And it has supporting type pages that go along with that as well. Debt education type pages. And from there that covers it. So that is that full set of reports available to you. 
And let me get back to the program. We're running a little bit short on time, but I want to show you that customer access piece. So I'll just minimize our reports. We've gone through everything that you really need to know to run this program, but that client access piece is pretty cool. So let me just show you how to set that up before we uh, end the class here. So if I go back to the client tab, we can see a customer access section. This is where we can set this up. They can they can choose a plan. They can you can set a password. So this is the password that they'll need to be able to um, log into their customer access portal. I'm never going to remember what that is, so I'm going to just type password for this uh, purpose here. You can specify when this information, the access to this information ends. So if you want them to only be able to look at it for a week something like that. You can set a date. Oh, let's see. Click on update and continue. Next, it's going to ask you if you want to allow the client to view reports. So you can have either them just view data input or you can have them be able to view data input and reports. So let's say, yeah, we want them to be able to view reports. We do want to say it's a draft copy because maybe we're just showing it to the client but we haven't actually sat down to review the information with them yet. You can also choose what report that they can view. Do you want them to view the full report or just the retirement report or just the insurance analysis? So you can pick and choose just like when you generate your own reports. Welcome text. This shows up on the home page when they log in. So if you want to give them any specific greeting or instructions, you can do that here. Hello, client. The last item is going to be important. Enable, disable. So you need to make sure enable customer access is checked. If you want to stop customer access, you can also just come in here and uncheck this box. From there, you have a link that you need to send to the client. So you can copy this whole thing send it in an email. We typically recommend you just copy the URL and send that in an email and you call the client and give them their password separately rather than sending it all together. One thing I actually skipped at the very beginning here, customers may make changes to this plan. This checkbox impacts if they can actually make changes to the data input. If you are going to allow customers to make change, uh, we recommend copying the plan and then allowing the customers to have access to that copied plan so if they do make changes it doesn't actually impact the plan that you created for them. So that's a good tip for you to remember. So in this case we'll say no, they can't make changes to the plan, but they can review the data input and they can see the reports. So if I type in that URL, you'll see what your client would see. They would provide the password, here's that greeting that I, that I specified, and you can see that they can review the data input that's been entered into the system. So they can see their insurance policies, they can see their pensions, social security, uh, regular earned income that have been entered, so they'll see everything that you've entered into the plan, and then if you allow them to view reports, you, they can also generate that report and take a look. So. That client access can be a handy tool, and if you have any questions on how to set it up or best practices for using it, uh, just let us know and we can help you out with that. So I think that about covers everything I wanted to talk about for today's class on Silver Online. One thing that um, I want to make sure you guys have is our contact information for support. When you are using the program, there is help within the system. So if we go back to the program here, you'll notice this question mark on the top right hand side. That will open up the help to the, the window that you're working on, so that's a great place to start. But also feel free just to contact support when you do run into any questions. Um, our support line is available weekdays, Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. and we are in Oregon, so it's specific time. Here's our phone number. Of course, you can always grab that from our website, which is just moneytree.com. 
you can call us anytime within those hours. There's no limit to the number of questions you can ask or assistance. If it's anything like um, you have a question on how to model something specific or tracking down numbers on reports, anything like that, we'll be able to help you. You can also send emails to support and you'll get a response very quickly from that uh, as well, which is just emailing support at moneytree.com. So I think that covers everything I wanted to cover, and thank you very much for attending today's class on Silver Online.